community services. And I'm excited to see all of you here and to be sharing this space with Dowd and the youth in our community. Um, I'm going to do a territorial acknowledgement um, in English and then Dowd is going Oh, Debbie, you might have accidentally muted yourself there. There he goes. I won't touch my board, apparently. As we gather, I'm reminded that most of us are situated on the land that is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contribu contributions Indigenous people have made in shaping and strengthening this community. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise of the challenge of truth and reconciliation in our community. Uh, nous aimerions commencer et des peuples neutres. Nous reconnaissons également la présence durable ainsi que les connaissances, les droits et les philosophies traditionnelles et profondes des peuples autochtones avec lesquels nous partageons cette terre aujourd'hui. Nous sommes tous des gens issus des traités et nous avons la responsabilité d'honorer toutes nos relations. All right, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as you know, Canada is heading into a snap election and federal candidates in our community need to know what is important to youth. Today, we are joined by Bardis Chager from the Liberal Party running in Waterloo, Bizan Zubi from NDP running in Kitchener Center, C.A. Morrison, an independent running in Kitchener South Hespeler, Ellen Pappenberg from the Animal Protection Party running in Kitchener Center, and Michelle Braniff from the Green Party running in Cambridge. So we will start by asking an intro question, followed by three questions uh, posed and selected by youth, and we'll end with a closing question. Each question, uh, each candidate will take turns answering questions. We will go in alphabetical, uh, alphabetical order uh, by first name. That is the opening question begins with Barnish and down the list, and then the second question begins with Bizan and down the list and so on. Uh, attendees, please note that your mics will be muted but we will be monitoring the chat. So folks are encouraged to share their thoughts with us throughout the conversation. Um, so the first question is, we want to get to know a bit about the candidates. Please introduce yourself, uh, your party, and let us know where your favorite place to eat is. You each have five minutes and Debbie will hold up a sign when one minute remains. Uh, Bardish, we begin with you. Excellent. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Merci à tous d'avoir pris le temps d'être ici avec nous cet après-midi. Uh, my name is Bartis Chager. I am the Liberal candidate in the riding of Waterloo. I've had the honor and privilege of serving this riding since 2015, when the good people of Waterloo elected me for the first time and re-elected me in 2019. I got involved in politics when I was 13 years old. And I got involved in politics because even though I did not have a vote, I did have a say. And some of the policies and positions I was taking were not always in line with my family or my parents. And so they created the space to get me involved within the civic process and democracy. And so for me, youth voices matter. And that's why I'm really proud to represent the Liberal Party because Justin Trudeau, when we were in the third party, he became the critic for youth. When he became prime minister and our government was elected in October 2015, he served not only as prime minister, but as the first minister of youth since Confederation. In November 2019, he asked me to take on those responsibilities as minister of diversity and inclusion and youth. Because when we make decisions and we advance legislation and policies, it actually impacts young people for a lot longer, just by age wise. And I think it's important that your voices be represented. And when it came to this pandemic, it was young Canadians who rolled up their sleeves and actually bridged the intergenerational gap by using technology to communicate with one another, who made their grandparents realize what FaceTime was and gave virtual hugs. It was young people who went to go check in on their neighbors. And even in my community here in Waterloo, Mike Crescent, we had people coming in um, from south of the border and they actually planned a package of snacks and the one gentleman who loves brownies shouldn't eat them 
that had two brownies in that little care package just to make sure that we give each other love and support. And we know that young Canadians face some of the worst economic and mental health impacts of the pandemic. And we stepped up and put forward one of the largest youth support packages in the world. And we want to double our efforts to support young people because we believe that when you invest in young people, you're investing in Canada's future. Justin Trudeau often says, young people are not only the leaders of tomorrow, you are the leaders of today. And for me personally, as somebody who got involved well before I could vote, I helped advance same-sex marriage legislation. I helped advance dying with dignity, today called medical assistance in dying. I helped advance you know, a manufacturing strategy as well as the legalization of cannabis. And I think it's important that we actually peel back these conversations and look at substance use and look at why people are using substances and actually listen to the diversity of perspectives that exist in our country and even around the world. And so my focus will always be here in the Waterloo region. I often say as much as the world needs more Canada, Canada needs more Waterloo region. I am born and raised in this region and I chose to be a liberal because it's the party in which I can actually advance a lot more policy and actually make the changes that I want to see. I graduated from the University of Waterloo with a Bachelor of Science. I chose to go into science in grade six because I went to a day with the difference at the University of Waterloo. And they speak, spoke about the importance of having more women in fields of science. And that's where I want to help create more space. And you know, Canada is large and I always say our best natural renewable resource is our people and it's all of you. And therefore I will look forward to today's conversation and actually sharing um, some of what we're doing. And I want to plug our platform at liberal.ca because it not only shares what we've been able to accomplish thus far, but where we're going. And I think it's important that everyone know that today we have a youth policy in Canada. Today, we have a prime minister's youth council, which represents the diversity of regions and perspectives and experiences and languages of our country. We also have established the youth secretariat so that when government is making decisions, young people actually have a say. And we've actually launched the first state of the youth report so that diverse voices of young people can better guide government priorities and action. We committed to 75% of Crown corporations having at least one young voice, youth voice at the table, and we have seen that become a reality. And there's actually a desire to see even more people represented. And as I'm running out of time, my favorite place to eat. So my grandfather immigrated to Waterloo in the early 70s, and my mom till this day cooks authentic Indian cuisine. And so I have to say my favorite place to eat is at home for my mom's home cooking and she's had an amazing garden this year. So my favorite vegetable, which most people won't know about is bitter melon, absolutely delicious. And if you don't know how to cook it, I'll ask my mom to help share it with you. So thanks for having me. I look forward to our time together. Uh, thank you, Vardish. I think we'll go with uh, CA next. Hello. Hello, peace. Uh, my name is uh, Andrea Morrison and I am running as an independent out here in Kitchener, South Hespler. I uh, was born in Montreal, but raised out here in Kitchener. I think I'll kind of open with my favorite place to eat, which would probably be Mark's Caribbean Kitchen, um, just any kind of Caribbean food. I, I call myself a Jamaican because my, my parents are Jamaican, even though I was born here and uh, raised in Canada. Um, I really got involved with politics primarily because of what's been going on I, with respect to our constitutional and charter rights. I'm very concerned about some of the orders that have been put in place, um, limiting some of our rights under the charter, such as our ability to express ourselves by wearing masks and not being able to speak and breathe uh, freely. Our ability to worship and uh, assemble and associate. These are like sacred rights under the constitution and the charter. Our ability even to travel, to vote, to run for office. All of these have been significantly limited recently because of the various orders under the Emergency Management Civil Protections Act. And um, that just gives me a great deal of cause for concern. I, I was, was raised out here and as a youth at 16, I went to New York City 
uh, with my mother who was a nurse and I ended up going to law school out there, Columbia Law. I had a daughter and you know, lived that whole life. I was a finance attorney for close to 20 years. And um, I became somewhat disillusioned by the, um, the scandals and you know, just the whole experience of the subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, while I was in the industry. And at the same time that all of these things were going on just you know, nationally and internationally, I also um, lost my mother. And I also realized that I was gay, which was kind of from out of nowhere. I was married for close to 20 years and came to that realization. Anyways, my life was just pretty much an upheaval and I decided to leave the practice of law and pursue something more tangible and focus more on healing and spirituality. So I opened up um, a, a sanctuary in Denver, Colorado called the Sacred Smoke Sanctuary. And it was focused on the spiritual, medicinal, as well as cultural uses of cannabis and ganja. And it was, I ran it as a nonprofit, um, which was you know, unusual for at the time, it was right at the beginning of legalization. And I had quite um, an experience from that, ended up being homeless for a while and losing everything. And um, that's brought me to a whole other um, level of sensitivity and has also motivated me to run for this election because I'm very concerned about people such as myself who have limited resources. And I wanna make sure that we continue to be a part of the democratic process and involved in parliament. And I just feel like a lot of, a great deal of the rules that are put in place kind of are limiting to us who don't have uh, resources. And in conjunction with that, you know, I've been very concerned as well about you know, just racial issues generally and um, indigenous rights as well as rights of people such as myself uh, as of, an, of um, African descent. So uh, I've decided that I was gonna run and I just kind of went out and collected you know, the signatures, a requisite number of signatures. And now I'm just running this grassroots campaign uh, on a very limited budget, really no budget. Um, but but I'm really, I really appreciate the fact that I have the opportunity to speak. I feel much better than I did before because so much of this was just totally distressing for me. And I guess I will just end since I'm running out of time. I'll just talk about um, my last part of the part, last part of my platform, which is health. And I believe in natural healing and self-healing and faith healing. I wanna make sure that our rights to heal ourselves and our rights to our bodies are always maintained. And we always have the right to choose what kind of medicines we wanna use and how we wanna heal ourselves once we aren't hurting other people. And I, I'm very focused as well on faith healing and ensuring that people can exercise their religious beliefs and their, their beliefs and how they should heal um, under the constitution, which gives us our right to life. And I just would like to close with that and remind everyone that Christ was a faith healer and I believe in faith healing um, and I would uphold it whether I believed in it or not. Peace. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and we will go to um, Ellen next. I think you're on mute. Of course. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having us here. And uh, I would say um, uh, it is a great opportunity to have, especially for a small party like we are, because we often don't get uh, to speak at all in uh, all candidates meetings, which is a bit undemocratic, but that is how it is right now. Uh, I'm so I'm Ellen Papenberg and uh, pronouns uh, are uh, she, her. I am the candidate for Kitchener Riding for the Animal Protection Party. Go to animalprotectionparty.ca to see the platform. My favorite place to eat, uh, to, to get that out of the way before I start uh, uh, talking about what I am about further, is, is basically also at home, and, but uh, otherwise any good vegan or uh, vegetarian restaurant. Um, I do acknowledge that uh, the region of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the six nations that include six miles on each side of, of the Grand River. Having said that, acknowledgement is not enough. We should have safe housing, safe water, uh, access to education for the original peoples in this country. Uh, we are the guests and we made a mess in their house. 
and we should be aware of that. Uh, true reconciliation should happen with First Nations being in charge. If we would have listed to the original people, we wouldn't have been in this climate trouble we are in. This is globally the case. And the youth is our future. We have to give them all the opportunity. They are the next generation. They are left with the mess we made, but we can still do something now. I am a grandmother. I am very worried about the future of my grandchildren. This is why I am with the Animal Protection Party, because we have solutions. What can we do right now? I mean, I don't have to go to Ottawa. You can do something yourself. Reduction of uh, uh, eating animal pr products. Uh, the land that is now used for animal feed, 80% of the agricultural land uh, would be freed. And then we can basically plant trees, plant forests, reinstate wildlife either. And this would offset carbon emissions way more effectively uh, than just going electric cars. Of course, we have to do that too. And oil uh, reduction of uh, uh, fossil fuels. You see, we, by eating animals, we use up 16 times more plants. It's a waste. And the animal production basically uses a lot of methane, water. We talk about almonds, you know, uh, taking so much water. Well, the animal production is taking way more, more water. At a certain point, there will be no more fish in the ocean within 10 years at the rate where we're going right now to consume fish. So we can do this ourselves because there is no planet B. We have nowhere to go. But the party is about uh, compassionate politics, better place to, to make a better place for all beings, not just animals. Of course, we are human animals, so we have to take care of that. In 2019, I was in Holland. I'm from there originally, and there was a Congress of the Party for the Animals. And they have five MPs and two sen senators and one person in the European Parliament. And why? Because there's proportional representation. Uh, and they have an enormous influence, even with those few seats. Uh, the protection we have here for animals is not enough. The transportation of food animals is, is terrible. They don't go without food or, or drink or rest for even up to 52 hours. Uh, even pets are not protected enough. If you lose a pet, you don't know where it will end up. It might be used for uh, animal testing. Uh, and that is not just the one time, but the rest of their lives. And the nicer they are, the nicer uh, they will behave uh, for that. And of course, we would work with other parties. <laughs> if we would get even in there, then we, we have to because we're small, right? So but we still would poke the, the bear without hurting the bear. <laughs> and we would ask them to give proper attention to animals and also the human animals. Uh, and thinking here uh, of healthcare, dental healthcare, pharma care, eye care, should all be a basic right and so shouldn't cost uh, any, any money, especially not for the people that don't have it. Uh, mental Nine. healthcare is uh, uh, quite neglected. Homelessness should not exist. Food banks should not need, be needed. We should have that all organized. So I came from Holland 40 years ago and was appalled about homeless people on the street. You know, education should be free, like in Denmark, the Nordic system. Better education will create better jobs. Better jobs, childcare would free up the women in the workplace, and good jobs means buying power. The economy would improve and we would pay more taxes. But first, the climate. Time. Uh, first the climate, no planet, no economy. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. And we will end with Michelle. Thanks very much. Um, I'm really grateful to be here and a uh, really interesting forum and uh, a chance for uh, the youth to be, um, to be involved. So thank you. Um, my pronouns are she, her, Green Party of Canada. Uh, this is my third time running for the Green Party of Canada. And um, 
I'll start with my favorite place to eat. I like to eat outside <laughs> in my garden, having a picnic while I'm hiking, maybe on a patio. I even like to eat outside in the winter, but you have to uh, be careful <laughs> about the weather. Um, if I'm going to eat at a restaurant, I like the uh, locally owned restaurants. Um, I, I, not so much the chains. Um, I, I like uh, to support local businesses. And um, so it, it, a little bit about me, I, for my generation, I've had the kind of career that a lot of the youth are looking at in that I, uh, I've, I've had many, many careers. So I've been a lawyer, a mediator, an entrepreneur, an artist, uh, social innovator for the nonprofit, mental health sector. Uh, currently I teach uh, social justice, social policy and change at the college level. And um, really excited about the Green Party of Canada. We do politics differently. So it's, it's green because it's for the environment and the climate crisis is urgent um, in Canada. <laughs> It's not just a metaphor that our house is on fire. In fact, there are forest fires in Northern Ontario and BC um, and in Manitoba. It's urgent, we need to do something. The Green Party has the most aggressive uh, carbon emissions, uh, you know, 60% of 2005 levels by 2030, net negative by 2050. Climate ad adaptation is important. So we're green for the environment. We're also green because of innovation. We are a, a relatively new party in Canada in terms of being a national party. Internationally, we have links around the world and um, we embrace innovation, new ways of doing things, evidence-based politics. Thirdly, we're, we're green because we do do politics differently. So the old traditional way kind of treats it as if, um, as if there's a machine and the economy is some kind of pump. Um, you know, you hear about the economy all the time, all the measures that you hear about often are uh, about the economy, and it's as if there's some kind of pump and the government puts in a bit of money and, 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 and it primes the pump and then, uh, you know, you step back and, and hope that good things trickle down, uh, trickle down to vulnerable people, trickle down to the youth. Well, you know, this, this is a new era, a new time, we understand that social systems are like ecosystems. And in fact, the green way of doing politics is like a garden, like, like a farm, like an ecosystem. The government creates conditions for a prosperous and green uh, economy and, and for healthy, resilient communities. So we've got our our transition to a green economy, to, to a circular economy where we reuse things the way ecosystems reuse, and also one with social justice. Reconciliation is essential, um, looking after all people, universal um, uh, pharmaceutical care, basic dental care, uh, child uh, care with, 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 with childhood learning. So we're, 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 we're with, uh, with those programs, we're pushing the, the, uh, the in investment a little bit more. And we are the party that in terms of reforming democracy, give the 16 year olds the vote. The future is yours and you should be voting now. You are the leaders and you should be voting. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, we will begin with the first question by youth. Uh, and the question is, what are you doing to combat Islamophobia in Canada, including Bill 21? And what will you do to address international human rights violations? Uh, CA, we will begin with you. Hmm, what would I begin to address Islamophobia in Canada? Um, that's a really great question, and I'm glad that you've asked me that, uh, particularly because I am such a huge advocate for people exercising their faith and for people um, having their constitutional right, their right, their right to freedom of religion, to make sure that's always maintained. Apart from that, just addressing um, any kind of uh, phobia, but particularly Islamophobia, I feel that we need to 
learn a great deal more about Islam and, and Muslims and Muslim culture. I, um, I, I consider myself a Moor, that's my background, I'm a Moor. And even though I'm not a uh, Muslim Moor, there's, you know, because Moor is just really for dark people and people of the past, uh, I'm very much uh, familiar and connected to uh, Islamic culture and understanding it and bringing it forward. And I believe that there is a great, great more that needs to be brought forward and taught um, and shared with all of us. I am currently uh, working on um, opening up some kind of more schools where we can teach about um, you know, the history of the Moors as what should also include the history of, of the Muslims who have been huge significant contributors to our society and to our current culture. So I, I really believe that the way that we combat phobia, any kind of phobia, is really through knowledge and understanding. Peace. All right, next we'll move on to Ellen. Well, the education in our children and, and uh, youth, uh, it would help to show that uh, uh, all people of all religion and all races and all cultures are human and uh, that Islam Islamophobia is and racism is dehumanizing people and not seeing a person as a person and uh, so if we would have town halls and, and, and gatherings and more exchanges between different groups of people, that is how you can basically build an understanding for each other. That is a tall uh, call and tall order to, to, to uh, make uh, a reality, but it is possible. Uh, they have done it in different areas, uh, in different countries, and it can be done. Uh, but unfortunately, of course, the existing people that uh, are uh, applying hate uh, speech and so forth won't go to these things. But if we get the youth and the children uh, and the next generation, that will build a better country. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will be moving on to Michelle. So that's, um, that's a really important uh, topic. And um, I think one that requires a, 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 our focus and attention. At, at one level, criminal justice reforms in terms of the hate crimes. At the other level, um, I did a lot of work as a graphic recorder for the, the Crime Prevention Council a number of years ago, and certainly before uh, before COVID, but it was a it was a table of people coming together, and one of the themes was what we called upstream thinking. So the idea is you don't just deal with the crime or deal with the hate. I mean, you you obviously have to deal with it, but did you you go to the the causes and the root? And 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 I would argue that we have underinvested. So uh, you know, the Green Party as part of our Green Recovery Plan is 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 looking at uh, true cost accounting. You you have to look at what you're investing, not just in infrastructure, but also in people. So more investment in um, early childhood education, in, in mental health, in, in, in supporting people, in developing community and neighborhoods. If we invest in the community and neighborhoods, we will have more opportunity for pe people to meet someone who is different themselves and realize that they have more in common than what they realize. Uh, thank you, and Bardish? Thank you so much. Okay, so two minutes to answer this question is challenging, but I've just witnessed um, others be able to do it, so I can I can do it too. Um, I just want to acknowledge that in Canada, diversity is one of our greatest strengths, yet we know that discrimination and racism remain a daily reality for many. We acknowledge that systemic discrimination does exist in our institutions and in every segment of the population. So. Yes, the government has a role to play, and we are committed to working with all of civil society and the private sector uh, to ensure that we actually build an even better and consciously more inclusive Canada. 
So just some of what we've done. We came to office in 2015 and we created a new open, transparent, merit-based appointment process. And you can see the results of that process. And today there are more people um, that reflect the diversity of our country, including gender, including intersectionality, who are actually being appointed, but we know we can do better. And that's why it's important that we continue pushing for better. We brought in legislation, Bill C-25, which actually amends the Canada Corporations Act. And we launched the report on April 7th, 2021. So you can actually see what board uh, or directors actually look like in Canada, because part of the challenge is ensuring that the decision-making table represents the diversity of Canada. We um, passed private members motion M103, kudos to Ikra Khaled, member of parliament, um, which it was the first time that we not only acknowledged, but we condemned Islamophobia in Canada and committed to further action against racism. And it was FG M103 that helped inform the Canada's anti-racism strategy which is an evergreen document that includes a definition for racism. It condemns um, all forms of racism, including anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, anti-Semitism, um, anti-Asian, as well as Islamophobia in Canada. And so we've actually brought up programs like the Community Support Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism Initiatives Program, as well as the I know, anti-racism action program, I could go on for days. Um, but we are taking action and just on the international um, stage, Canada will always stand up for human rights. We will always um, ensure that not only at home, but around the world, that we are part of that conversation because it's essential. But we also have a lot of work to do here at home because we know our history with indigenous people. That's and time. That we build upon. Thank you, sorry. That's okay. All right, thank you all. Uh, we will move on to our second question, which is why are we having this election? Um, uh, Ellen, we will start with you. Why do we have elections? If we wouldn't have elections, then the people wouldn't have any say of uh, what should happen. And of course, uh, uh, if parties or people don't keep their promises uh, and the, uh, divert from their promises, uh, then we are still in trouble. And that happens, unfortunately, because humans are humans. Uh, so um, they, they have often a hidden agenda and not always, but um, unfortunately, uh, we have a very bad system here in Canada. There's only three countries in the whole world that have a first past the post system, which means that with a small percentage, you can have a majority of government, which is very undemocratic. Um, if we would have a more a proportional representation, uh, then uh, yeah, we would have some smaller parties uh, into the game. But uh, to tell you the truth, every big party has small parties inside. And uh, so you don't know actually who you are voting for. I mean, I'm from Holland and we have uh, uh, proportional representation and yeah, some crazy parties come in, but mostly they're good and it represents the people. And that is why we should have elections to represent the people that, uh, that who are voting for us. And uh, let's hope that we can get a better system. I know that parties are very reluctant to do this because they feel they shoot themselves in the foot, but in the long term, it will benefit us all to have proportional representation. Then we have true democracy. Thank you. Um, we go to Michelle next. I just wanna uh, uh, say if I wasn't uh, clear, um, the question is, why are we having this election? Thank you. Um, I do agree with Ellen with respect to proportionate representation. It, um, it, 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 more, it not only morally, more fairly reflects the vote, but in fact, um, some of the regionalism in Canada is aggravated by, uh, by the, the way uh, the, uh, the, 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 the seats work. So proportionate representation often leads to uh, more moderate voices, a lot of collaboration, the, um, in order to form a government, the issues are discussed in a nonpartisan way, um, which, which gets us much further ahead. Um, in, in many European countries where there is proportionate representation, and Ellen's right, we're in a minority of democracies that we have not made that move, but in those, uh, you will see green government formed. So um, 
that was a promise of Mr. Trudeau in 2015, and I'll leave that to Bardish to talk about. Um, I'm not too sure why we're having an election now. Um, some of the best governments in Canadian history have been minority governments. That's how we got Medicare at, during a minority government. And this government was, uh, it was functioning. And I think it's, it's important uh, that we work across party lines. There are a whole lot of issues. If you listen to the leaders debate last week, there's a whole lot of issues that all parties agreed on. And we need to start moving towards action on the points of agreement and work together like an all party caucus for the climate, like during the war. Uh, so uh, I'm not too sure why we're having an election, but uh, so be it. Uh, thank you, and we'll move on to Bardish next. Thank you so much. So just to start by answering the question, we're having an election because, first of all, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. The federal government has stepped up and made sure that supports are available for Canadians, including businesses, youth, seniors, and the list goes on. But it's important that Canadians have a say. And right now, there are party leaders who are front and center, each with their vision for the future. And I would say the choices have never been starker. So it's important that Canadians choose that vision. And that's why we're having this election. You should get to decide the future of our country. As a person who has represented this community since 2015, I can tell you, usually I have a good sense of where constituents are at. Sometimes they might not agree but they believe it's good for their kids and their grandkids. Right now, there is not a consensus. And consensus does not mean agreement. It means that we can live with this decision and it helps us move forward for more people, forward for everyone. And so I would just say that's why. I encourage everyone to check out all party platforms. The Liberal platform is fully costed and available at liberal.ca. It not only shares where we've been and what we've been doing together, but how we can move better forward for a consciously inclusive Canada and with a comprehensive plan for housing, for the environment, for youth, including the removal of interest, which is a policy I wrote on Canada student loans, which is a policy I wrote in 2004. And just on electoral reform, as we committed to in 2015, we did set up a committee and that committee had all the parties that had 12 seats or more on that committee. We heard from the Bloc as well as the Greens that they deserve to have a say, we included them. They traveled the country, your tax dollars funded and supported them to do so. And the report that they tabled did not provide a ballot to replace the first past the post ballot with. And then what happened is every party, including I'll talk about the Liberals, providing a dissenting report. So I would encourage you to check out the report that was tabled. It is publicly available. And I just think that we have to find consensus to find a way forward. And it will take more than just the ballot changing. We also have to modernize the way the House of Commons works. Thank you. Thank you. And CA, we will go to you next. Hi. Um, yeah, I, why are we having an election now? That's something that uh, I wonder about as well. I'm fully in favor of the democratic process and our representative form of government. Um, and my understanding, you know, there's an election that was fairly recent. So um, in terms of, you know, having a mandate from Canadians, I feel that there already is one out there and I'm not really sure why there's a need to come back and check before moving forward. I would like to say that it seems like a very, it is a very difficult time to be holding an election in the middle of a crisis. Um, a great deal of our you know, rights and abilities to vote. I mean, there are people who are waiting on long lines, walking away with ballots. There's a lot of things that are going on and it's attributable to uh, us being in a crisis, even being able to gather and meet. I, as someone who don't, does not have a great deal of resources, um, you know, we need to be able to meet our meet our constituents and meet people in our in our neighborhoods. And during this crisis, that is very difficult to do. We're also under a great deal of um, time constraint. Um, for me, I'm just, you know, pulling it all together really last minute, trying to get, you know, budget together. And it's been, it's been very difficult. And, you know, it's, um, you know, I don't know if that's part of possibly the reason why it was, why it was called at this time. I do, I do have my suspicions about that. Um, but I am glad 
I'm very happy that we are having the election because it does give me an opportunity to speak and it does give me an opportunity to run and I wouldn't have been able to do so otherwise. So I appreciate that question. And, and I think it raises a lot of interesting you know, issues and you know, concerns, but at the same time, you know, I'm also happy that we are having it and I'm able to, to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. And we'll move on to our third question. Children and youth mental health is a huge issue. What are you going to do to add resources and support for mental health services, financial support, and prevention programs like recreation and leisure? We will start with uh, Bardish first. Excellent. So first of all, I just want to, I guess, take Canadians back, take all of you back to when we renegotiated the health accord um, after taking office in 2015. It was, one of the first times where we were not able to get all 13 provinces together to find agreement and sign it at the same time. And that is because we were committed to ensuring that not only home care supports were accessible for Canadians, but there was also youth uh, mental health supports available. So we were able to actually get all 13 provinces and territories in agreement by going province by province, territory by territory. And now you will see within our platform, a building upon not only making sure that there are supports available for mental health, but also that um, they're informed by community and by people across the country as to what your needs are. And that's where we want to actually focus on outcomes. There is only one leader right now talking about outcomes. And that's why we actually have started collecting disaggregated data through StatsCan to ensure that we have better information. We've also actually, in a re-elected liberal government, We'll introduce a new fund for student well-being to improve wait times and increase access to mental health care at colleges and university. And this fund will actually support the hiring of up to 1,200 new mental health care counselors, including those who can support the needs of BIPOC students at post-secondary institutions across Canada. We will invest $500 million over four years and dedicate 10% annually to support Indigenous governed and operated post-secondary institutions. This builds upon one of our first responses to the COVID-19 pandemic was to ensure that Kids Help Home was funded so that there was somebody always available 24 seven to answer your email, to answer your text, to answer your call. We also ensured that we've expanded those supports even now because we recognize that mental health is real. And I wanna give a shout out to the young leaders who have brought this to the forefront and I also want to give a shout out to the older generations who are recognizing that everyone is facing mental health concerns and we really do need to take it seriously. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You'll go to CA next. Hi. Um, you know, mental health is, is very much of concern um, for me. I have you know, family members who have experienced, who are having you know, mental health issues and experiences as well as um, there's a great deal of information out there, particularly about people of color uh, who tend to have uh, higher incidence, incidences and uh, more uh, issues connected with mental health, particularly stemming from the lack of acceptance and understanding about our culture. So I feel that one of the main things that would help with our mental health is to just have a feeling of acceptance and understanding in our society about um, different people and different cultures and just to feel the love. I know it feels sounds simple, but I feel like that's really where that stems from is feeling loved and feeling accepted. And I feel like that's something that we could focus a great deal um, more on. I really believe that we should explore more indigenous and natural healing methods, um, going through for some non-traditional and alternative methods to for helping for helping us all um, through our mental health issues and making sure that people are are happy and stable and um, and secure. Uh, I am additionally concerned about you know substance abuse, and I feel that that's also very much related to uh, to mental health. So all of those things are of, of main concern for me. And I really feel that the way that we can combat it is to look to the future and get some um, answers from the future, but also look to the past and see how some of these issues were dealt with within the past and see if we can bring those forward to, to help us. Um, and I talk a little bit more about my natural health and my feelings on that 
at my website, https colon forward slash morrison519.square.site. Feel free to check it out, um, you know, and I'd love to talk to people more about, about these issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and we'll go to Ellen next. Well, often it's not acknowledged and, and based away basically by uh, our society and culture. You know, stiff upper lip and uh, uh, get over it, you know, you're just a bit blue and, and so forth. Uh, that is a big problem. And uh, the only way to, to address this is that we start talking about it. Uh, uh, we are not talking about it. Let's get uh, sort of uh, brushed under on on their, uh, the, the doormat, uh, as it were, and uh, just get rid of it. Uh, we don't want to know about it because uh, it is uh, it has some stigmatization and, and people are ashamed of it often, you know, <clears throat> being looked upon that uh, that you're crazy and uh, too often uh, the medical uh, uh, world is is uh, basically prescribing pills and medication instead of uh, looking at uh, cognitive therapy or natural ways of doing it as well um, it is all about the uh, compassionate politics which is uh, our party about uh, to have compassion to to your neighbor, to your fellow human being, to your fellow animal being. And uh, we should be able to talk about it and address it because there are solutions for it. We also have to look at why uh, 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 do people have a problem? What is it caused by? Because uh, it is not just, okay, well, it's a clinical thing and, and, and we will just put a, a little bandaid on it. You have to look at the cause of these problems. And uh, that is not done enough. And we have to change that uh, with, with politics, with education, and looking at uh, what the medical world is, is right now doing uh, with the youth as well, but also in general with mental health. Uh, thank you. And we shall finish with Michelle. Thanks. Um, I said this in Cambridge a few times, but uh, yes, the Liberals definitely are moving in the right direction and good start. The Green Party would invest, invest much more. Um, I know the Liberals are looking at uh, PharmaCare and the, the, the difference, one of the differences with the Green Party platform is we would create a bulk drug purchasing agency. So that would help reduce the costs. And uh, if you did that first, it, 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 it can help finance that, uh, reduce drug patent protection, because it, it, there's kind of two tiers if, if some people can't afford the, 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 the services. Uh, the Green Party would expand the Medicare model to include long-term care and for sure enhance mental health services. That's the sector that I came from. One of the huge problems was youth with chronic mental health problems um, there was no smooth transition into the adult system. So health is, is provincial, but the feds have a role because um, the, 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 the Green Party would restore the Canada Health Accord. And so basically um, what that means is instead of being tied to a percentage of, of GDP, gross domestic product, that um, the transfers from the federal government are going to be based on actual demographics and health needs. So, so that really needs to happen in order to have more funds available. We need to have the mental health um, and rehab services. We need to invest in community services. Organizations like Horizon do mental health work, do not get funded in the same way that hospitals do. We need more of a connection with primary care. We need to address issues uh, around the opioid poisoning crisis, no one's intentionally taking opioid, opioid. it's it's not a, an overdose, it's a poisoning, and, um, and that needs to be declared an emergency, addressed um, as a health crisis, decriminalizing um, the, the, the use, and making sure that we have a safe, uh, safe supply. The other thing that's really important is we need to fix up the environment and the ecosystem. If, if we do not address the quality of air and water, 
our health and our mental health will continue to decline. There is this existential crisis of pretending that nothing is happening while the planet is at risk. And we need to do our very best and address that crisis for everyone. But but the, the, the planet's health is also mental health. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we had a quick question in the chat. Um, do any candidates work with local youth councils? Um, we will give one minute to each candidate. And um, Ellen, we'll start with you. Um, I'm uh, not at the moment. Uh, we are uh, uh, here in this in this writing. I am here six years and uh, I've done a lot of uh, volunteer work with all kinds of organizations, uh, but particularly youth, especially. Uh, no, I've not uh, been involved with that, but, uh, but if you want to have me, I will be there. <laughs> Thank you, and you will go to Michelle next. Um, so currently, I have to be very careful how I explain this because it's with the city of Cambridge and there's a conflict of interest policy, <laughs> but um, the city of Cambridge has um, citizen uh, advisory committees. One of them is for well-being, and a subcommittee of that is youth and seniors. So I have um, an opportunity uh, to have um, participate as in an advisory role um, on what happens at the municipal level um, to ensure that, uh, you know, so our advisory committee listens to youth, the issues of youth, and, and, and um, bring that forward to the attention of the wellness committee to, to take that to, to, uh, to the city. And I am, um, I'm happy to have, um, to have that role and, and to, uh, to, to participate as a citizen um, at, at that. Uh, thank you. And you'll go to Bardish next. Thank you so much. So um, I do think I'm at a little bit of an advantage in answering this question because I was recently appointed the Minister of Youth in Canada. So yes, I've been working with um, youth councils across the country, um, but also just youth leadership programs right here in the Waterloo region. Prior to getting elected in 2015, I was engaged um, with um, Minor Tackle Football Association. So a lot of those young people have actually, you know, moved, grown up and gone to post-secondary, but I've remained connected within these circles to ensure that the voices of young people are included in the decisions that I make. So my short answer is the ones that I have been able to find and have reached out to me um, both ways. Yes, I have continued working with. We also do have a Prime Minister's Youth Council today in Canada. We also work closely with other members of Parliament and their youth councils. Um, so I would say we have tremendous leadership within the region of Waterloo when it comes to actually uh, youth councils and youth leadership programs. So it's been an honor and privilege. And CA, we will go to you next. Uh, I, I, I work with youth all the time, particularly in my family. There's no formal youth council that I am connected with. Uh, that's part of a reason why I run to is just being here and seeing what's going on, particularly with our constitutional and charter rights. And I'm very concerned, as I've said, about the future. It's the kids who are our future and the youth, they are our future, but we are the now and it's time that we do something now for the future. And I, as an adult, feel super extremely responsible for the world that we are leaving for our youth. So I very much welcome the opportunity to speak with Youth, youth Council and to hear more of what, your, what, what the concerns are for youth. I hear it from my family and my young friends, but I'd love to hear it in a more formal way as well. And I welcome the opportunity and I'd love to chat with anyone. I'm also doing a podcast starting up tonight at seven on racial recon reconciliation. And, you know, just feel free to join in and talk. And I would just love to hear from people and particularly our youth, because you are the future and, and you mean very much to all of us and that, you know, you're the ones that we're gonna be leaving behind. Enjoy, peace. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to our closing question. Having had the opportunity to learn more about what questions are top of mind for young people in Waterloo Region, how are you going to bring this back to your party and the work you will do if elected? 
we will start with CA. I don't have a, a party. I mean, I, I'm running as an independent because I really feel that even though I see many different uh, parties represented in my district, there's no one specific party that I, I see predominating. And I just feel like we're an independent district and we make decisions independently. And I felt like, I feel like I would be the best representative for this district on that basis. What, from what I've heard today, the main concerns are um, with respect to mental health, as well as, you know, Islamophobia and, and discrimination. And these are all issues that are very dear to me uh, and are the basis of why I'm running. I'm concerned about discrimination and I've experienced it um, myself. I am concerned about our health, mental, physical, all kinds of health, our spiritual health as well. And I want to make sure that Canadians go into the future thriving and happy and healthy. Um, so what I would, the way I would bring this into my campaign going forward is really reaching out more to more youths and extending myself more to more groups um, so that we can talk and share and communicate. So feel free to check me out, peace. Uh, thank you, we will go to Michelle next. So the questions I've heard um, really underline um, what I, I suspected and knew all along, and that that is that the youth are 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 forming decisions and opinions based on on policy, based on evidence, not on self interest, but on the welfare of, of building community and and as citizens in a better country, and um, the youth should be part of the decision-making process. We need democratic reform. And um, it, 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 it's interesting because I've watched politics evolve um, and women are, are, are think, um, not as represented as much as we would like, but even as women start being represented in parliament, the culture gets challenged, the culture changes. Uh, Green party, uh, members of parliament, members of provincial parliament, to throw more than their own weight in terms of pushing forward evidence-based decision, collaborating when, when good uh, decisions are being made, pushing for a little bit more. And I think what will happen is if the youth, um, you know, as we get momentum and young people are voting, it, it's going to give us a more future-oriented approach to how we make decisions, not, not so much the short term, for this election or the next election, but how about we start thinking, I look at my grandchildren and my great nephews and nieces, and at the turn of the next century, they will be grandparents. And I would like to think we're leaving behind a wonderful Canada for the grandchildren's grandchildren. And, and you guys are still gonna be around at that turn of century. You should be voting, you should have a decision and you will change the culture by having that young representation, those young voters, we need you. Uh, thank you. And we'll go to Ellen next. Okay, well, I, I heard in these um, questions uh, a lot of compassion, actually, for uh, about racism, racism and, uh, and sport and Islamophobia. Uh, so that is very interesting. Also, why do we have this election? Uh, what to do about mental health, uh, especially with youth? Uh, and this is all in our street of compassionate politics. Uh, now we could reach out a bit more to the, to the, to the youth in, in general. Uh, and that is what I will bring back to, uh, to, to the party. Uh, but of course we are really busy to, to, to look at the future uh, with climate change and uh, what is happening with our earth because we won't have any future, we won't have any new uh, next generations if we don't do something about our earth and the climate change. So that is a very important uh, thing to address and the future uh, is with the youth uh, but we can, we can help and uh, we can help guide it to do something right now as adults, but also the youth to, to again, you know, reduce the uh, intake of animal products and build forests and make a better planet out of, uh, out, out of this earth because we do not have a planet B. 
and we can talk uh, while we're standing on our heads about all kinds of politics. But if we don't do something about climate change, it is upon us five times as many weather disasters than uh, 10, 20 years ago. And that is going to continue. So we, we are really in a big, big trouble and the youth is our future and we are fighting for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we shall end with Barnish. Thank you. So I just want to, um, I'm actually older than the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And as much as I might seem very old, many people would say I'm quite young. And so I think it's really important that we recognize that our rights and freedoms are quite recent. And with rights and freedoms come responsibilities. And part of that responsibility is to ensure that Parliament is working for Canadians, the very people that we are elected to serve. And yes, we have been able to come together oftentimes at the 11th hour to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure that supports were in place. But we had to compromise a lot. We were not able to advance legislation such as the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which actually would include the right to a healthy environment. We were not able to advance and pass and make into law the banning of conversion therapy and the list goes on. I want to encourage all of you to check out the State of the Youth Report. We have established a youth secretariat, as I mentioned, and this report was created by youth for the government of Canada and all institutions and all of civil society to see where young people are at with the diversity of perspectives that they engage and they have informed us. It actually was written by young leaders. And so I would say to you, to answer the question, I will continue pushing to be your voice and to listen twice as much as I speak. I commit to you as the Liberal Party. We've always had the young Liberals as a youth wing who advanced tremendous progressive policies and we brought more people along. So I want to just plug once again, the state of the youth report that we have in Canada. Please check out the youth policy that is a Canadian policy that many have helped to create and we want more to engage with. And I do want to just thank everyone who came together and took time out of their busy schedules, especially to the organizers for bringing us together. I've had a tremendous time being able to be part of a respectful forum. And that's often why I say as much as the world needs more Canada, Canada needs more Warloo. Last thing I'll say, please don't vote. in the community you want. Thank you. All right. Hang on, I have a phone ringing at the same time. Um, so I wanna thank both the candidates and our youth for attending today. I want to thank Dowd for keeping me organized and helping me um, moderate this and, um, and really appreciate that. I am so confident and so privileged that we have such amazing youth who really do care about what's happening in our community and the world and that they took the time to be here. And I appreciate the candidates are really busy um, and I appreciate you being here as well. We picked three questions that were voted by the youth to bring forward. But we have a whole list of questions that um, we're going to share with the candidates so you know what youth are considering. So we will make sure that you get those questions and so that you can help move them forward. And I want to remind everyone that we are going to be hosting a youth election closing the end day of September 20th. And we'll be sharing the recording of today's events with participants, as well as a link for an anonymous vote in the youth election. So those of you who are here encourage um, people to vote and to watch the video link we want to be able to get as many voices as possible to be able to share what youth are thinking so again i want to thank all of you for your time and um, have a good evening